So I would, I would never say testing is a bad thing. Testing is always a good thing. You must always test, even if you're using formal methods. But when do you have enough? So, so you often see this phrase in Agile, done, done. So I thought I'd use the phrase enough, enough. So when is it enough? How do you know? I mean, on, on most domains, you, uh, our most interesting domains are infinite. So what do you do in that situation? Okay, you, can, you can't even test everything in the finite domain because those domains could be huge. <coughs> also, if you, if you try and anyone has tried to, to write a program of just a few lines long, you can see that um, it's very difficult sometimes to get it right. I remember uh, years and years ago when, when it was the uh, Star Wars program and, and, and I can't remember who the expert they, they interviewed he said he's never seen a program longer than five lines work. So, and then there's also other examples as well. You give somebody say, like a stack to implement. A lot of people, sometimes very eminent computer scientists, mentioning their names will get it wrong. You know, so it's quite difficult to, to implement certain things. So what happens when you move to the parallel domain? There's lots more problems to think about. So how will we test the system by writing test cases when we move to parallelism? And of course, key thing, I mean, I think there's a talk, there's a talk later on about safety critical, but so I'm very interested to hear about um, formal methods in safety critical because I think Agile, maybe some, I did find, um, I did find something on the web about um, a pacemaker being developed in an Agile approach, and it was talking about uh, the number of bugs that were introduced. I mean, something like a pacemaker, you want to make sure that it works, and you can't just roll in a load of people to test it out. You could simulate it, perhaps, but you can't test it in the, in the field, so to speak, using test-driven development. Or you'd probably call that test-driven death. So I think formal methods uh, can help us out again here. So one thing we could do is to uh, to generate uh, test cases. So you could use Perl or Python, or, or my preferred choice, just for my background, would be to use functional programming. Map, map a lambda expression over some generated sequences uh, of data. Also my preferred choice, just for my background, but notice hopefully my ex-colleagues won't be watching this video, but I mentioned Coverity rather than PRQA because uh, Coverity is a very good tool for, for bug catching. So you can use a static analyzer uh, to find various different issues in the code which you couldn't find uh, just by testing testing alone. I think one of the, uh, one of the uh, NASA projects had failed, there was a bug and it was due to an uninitialized variable. So those kind of things you're likely to find using tools, particularly static analyzers. And of course, static analyzers can't find everything. So you need to complement that with the testing, that dynamic testing tools as well. As I said about when you move to parallelism, so things like uh, a deadlock situation, you, you're not necessarily going to find that by testing alone. So you should use something like a model checker. So you imagine the situation now. So you've got your regression suite and uh, so you're changing code, you're continually writing tests, but the question is, when is enough enough? So what you need to do is really to, to check your uh, regression suite for gaps. How good is it? So one technique that's available to do this is called mutation testing. And so you imagine you take your, say, C++ code, and you might selectively remove statements, uh, or you may change uh, a less than to a greater than, recompile your code, run your tests, and then you see, well, does the regression suite fail? So in other words, introduce this mutant, and does your regression suite kill this mutant? So this is a good way of actually checking that your regression, regression suite is uh, fit for purpose, if you like. Okay, so this, I don't say very much about the next thing, uh, about changing uh, requirements, apart from you could use formal methods again, contracts, various different ways of tracing uh, what's happened during your uh, changes to requirements. So I want to talk about uh, refactoring code now and, and defects. So why do we refactor code? So the Agile community have introduced this uh, terminology, uh, smells, code smells, and it kind of really refers to different uh, parts of the code which, if you like, look suspect. 
so there's a number of smells that they've identified, and the idea is you, you identify the smell, you change the code, you remove the smell, clean it up. Uh, the, other, the other reason for refactoring code is, as I said, this example about somebody changing the, the names of variables, some people just like to write things in a certain way and they change it because they can. I mean, that's not a good way, uh, but people do it. You can try and prevent that from happening, but people, people will always try and change things because they think that's, that looks nicer than the other piece of code. So IDEs can carry out um, refactoring steps for you. Um, and they can do this automatically. So some of the very simple uh, refactorings can be done with the IDEs. But really, what you want to do, ultimately, is write an inefficient program that's clearly correct, refactor that down to something that is efficient, if you like, <coughs> looks nice, and ticks all the boxes in terms of your requirements. But that kind of uh, endeavor cannot in general, I believe, be done automatically because you need the kind of the eureka step. You know, what's what's the key thing that's that I need to change in this algorithm? And you could randomly generate all different programs that are correct that satisfy that, but you're not going to find the one necessarily the one you want. You're going from a say um, quadratic algorithm to a linear time algorithm or logarithmic time. That that really needs some insight, some domain knowledge, someone to really think about what I can do to improve this this program. So the only way you're going to introduce uh, these changes is manually. And of course, as soon as you start um, making the process manual, you're going to introduce errors. But then we get back to the situation again, OK, I've got some tests. But then are my tests good enough? Well, OK, they seem to be good enough. I've got my fixed period of time which I can develop software in. OK, so and as soon as that period's up, I'll be releasing, regardless of whether the tests are any good or not. So, if you take that approach and you don't have any safety net, then you can really uh, damage the software that you're producing. And to say, oh, we'll have another version in three weeks' time might not satisfy the end customer because it's, it's critical to their business. Their, their, their whole server goes down, for example, because you've, you've, you've made your code different because you didn't like the way it was written before. So, so I believe that refactoring is really, uh, is really just like a lot of these terms in Agile is like another name really for something which we've known about for a while with program transformation. Um, so really under the hood in these automated systems are correctness preserving transformations and you want to be able to add new transformations. So if you do come across, if you like, a step with a Eureka, introduce, introduce a new transformation and then prove that it's correct. So it's, it's repeatable, reusable. You don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel again. But of course, with any, any transformation system, there's going to be completeness issues and decidability issues. So, so my claim would be you could never do this fully automatically. You still need some, some guidance to, to get it right. So now I just want to talk about some, uh, so on the plus side, something good about um, Agile, which is uh, continuous integration. So as, as, as the title says, avoiding continuous disintegration. So the idea with continuous integration uh, is you frequently check in your code, you build frequently. So as soon as you as soon as you check your code in, it's automatically triggered by the build system. Um, the test is self-testing. You're, you're running tests continuously, and then what you do, you fix the defects straight away. And uh, because otherwise these things will fester, you'll, they'll just stay there. There'll be no time to fix it. So I saw this picture, I couldn't resist putting that in really. So uh, this is, <laughs> people don't like it when you break the build. <laughs> and the fact that you can actually um, just run another build doesn't help you if you've got some, some critical work to do. So as I say, you want to avoid the wrath of uh, Agnes. 